of all the struggles going on in the world, the single most important struggle is for your heart and the one to whom you will give your worship. Do you remember that Jesus, talking with the woman at the well, explained to her, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And in fact, Jesus said, the Father in heaven is seeking those kinds of worshipers. God is scanning planet earth, looking for those who are willing to bring him the worship he deserves. That's why our good friend A.W. Tozer said that worship is the eternal or everlasting preoccupation of the Christian heart. We're made for worship. You are designed to worship God, but alas, we worship many other idols. And so worship is at the core of who we are as Christians. We come to Sunday morning to gather with the saints, not out of obligation, but out of delight. We come because our souls breathe in celestial air when we worship. We come to get our focus upon the Lord. We come to have him scan our hearts and show us where they are wayward. We pray, examine our hearts and see if there is any wicked way in us. We sit in this sanctuary and sing the songs of praise and listen to the word of God so that we might draw near to God and he can draw near to us. Worship is designed for us as believers to express our gratitude and our spiritual life. And I've experienced a lot of moving worship gatherings over the years. This may seem strange, but the first and best worship gathering I ever remember was all by myself. I don't necessarily recommend it. In fact, I would say it takes two or three at least, but I was a brand new Christian, and I took my Bible, and I stole away to, to the uh, Tay River, which was nearby, and I found a quiet spot with the Tay River uh, crashing by, and I sat on the rocks, and I remember reading in Revelation when John said, I heard the voice of the sound of many waters, and my young Christian heart exploded before God because I thought I was right in the presence of God. But then not long after that, I attended my first uh, big worship service, big worship gathering. You see, I came from a small country church. Uh, a, a big Sunday morning was 50 people. At the height of a revival, we had 75. And we sang the old hymns with a lady who did her best. I won't say anything more to play the hymns. But it was coming from our hearts. I still remember looking up at my pastor as he was singing his guts out. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Then I went to my first Bible conference in Heartland, New Brunswick. There were 1,200 people in a giant auditorium, and I was late. I'm never late. I was late that day, and I walked in, and there were 1,200 people singing to the top of their voices, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. I thought I had been lifted into paradise. My soul was so moved. But I'm telling you, there is no worship gathering anywhere that could outdo the one that is recorded in Mark chapter 11. We call it Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry. Would you come with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11? And I want to read for you about this worship gathering and learn its significance for us as Christians. Mark 11, I'll begin reading at verse 1, and we'll go down through verse 11. And let me remind you, as always, the reading of God's Word is more important than anything I have to say about it, because one word of God is more important than 10,000 words of a man. Not to be little preaching, but God's Word is what you need to pay attention. And if I say something that's not in the book, delete it, dismiss it, and forget about it. If it's here, pay attention. I love it. Watch this. Now when they drew near, that is Jesus and his disciples drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethagy and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find a colt tied 
on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and he will send it back here immediately. Just, just a silly interruption. When you borrow something, take it back, or you're a thief. Jesus wasn't about to be considered a thief. I'll send it right back. Verse 4, and they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And lo and behold, some of those who were standing there said to him, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And he brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And this next phrase is not incidental. This is the point of the whole text. This is a deliberate act of Jesus announcing who he really is. And Jesus sat on the colt. His act alone fulfilled ancient prophecies. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. And then, in a messianic fervor, watch this in verse 8. Many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now watch verse 11. Seems like an afterthought, but it's quite critical. And he entered, the, so after a long day of this, uh, this worship gathering, where they were singing the praises of the Old Testament to him, he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And he looked around at everything. That's all we're told. It was already late, so he went back out to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Interesting. I'm calling this Bible study Hosanna in the highest. The word Hosanna simply means it's a prayer and a praise. It's a, it's a request and a praise to God. It simply means save now or save Lord, I pray. Save, I pray. It can mean help. It's used that way in uh, a few places. So save us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Deliver us, Lord, is the word. So I think this story tells us how God saves us, how he does it. Let me show you, first of all, in verse number one, he does it by coming to earth, his presence on the earth, his presence in ancient Jerusalem and ancient Israel. So let me remind you that as a Christian, we're not worshiping a mythological God. We're not following a carefully devised philosophy of a great way to live. We're following an individual who walked the planet in human flesh. We are following a Jesus who lived among us and walked the dusty streets of the ancient land of Israel. And we've been watching him through the book of Mark as he zigzags his way through the various places where he would serve and minister and make his gospel announcements. And so Jesus saves us by his presence in this world. He came to a particular place. This was his destination. Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives is very significant because this is the place that God appointed for him to make his great sacrifice. It's as old as the nation of Israel itself. Since the day God said to Abraham, I will show you the mountain where I want you to offer your son Isaac. Get up onto Moriah and offer your son as a sacrifice to me. In an act of obedience, God chose the place. God always chooses the place or the places where he wants his will to unfold in the world. He's sovereign. He knows all things, and so he chose Jerusalem to be the place where Jesus would end up. But remember, this is the focus of the life of Christ and the record of the Gospels, that Jesus lived, ministered, and served among us all for this very day, all for this very moment. What's interesting when you study the Gospel of Mark is that a full one-third of the Gospel focuses on only seven days, the last seven days of the life of Jesus. 
from Mark chapter 11 through 16, compared to John, who took a full 50% of his book to focus on the last week of the life of Christ. Why do the gospel writers do that? Because they want you to know that God has poured all of his energy into this moment. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Because this is God's heart. Jesus came into the world to save the world. And here he is. Notice the words. He's drawing near. He's getting ever closer to his goal. He's now in Jerusalem and on the Mount of Olives, where it all would come down, where he would make his ultimate sacrifice. His journey to Jerusalem is, um, was a busy one. It took about nine months from the time he left the Galilee he zigzagged his way from Galilee to Samaria to Perea and then Judea and now Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives where he would ultimately hang upon, not on the Mount of Olives, but outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem, he'd hang on a cross. He ministered to about 35 different individuals or in different circumstances on his way with the intention of arriving in Jerusalem at Passover. You know what's significant about that, don't you? The first time he came to, in his public ministry to celebrate the Passover, there was such a violent reaction by the religious leaders that he didn't return for three years. Even though the law commanded that every Jewish man be at Passover, Jesus was absent until this Passover when he would celebrate it with his disciples. He came to walk among us, live among us. He came to serve and ultimately to give his life as a ransom for many. And he did so in the ancient city of Jerusalem. Let me show you in the next paragraph. So you move on to verses 2 through 6, and I want you to see uh, the, the record of his word. Um, he gives his disciples a strict, meticulous word about preparing for the triumphal procession. He expresses every detail to them. Some Christians believe this is a miracle and he somehow supernaturally communicated to the owner of the donkey and, and the land owner that, that this was the moment they were to be prepared for. It could, be, it could have been that he did it in a dream. I tend to think that at some other point, Jesus sent instructions to someone whose life he had impacted and said, I need your cooperation on a particular day. Make sure that there is a colt that has never been ridden tied outside of your gate. Either way, that's not the point. The point is, you listening to me, church family? The point is that Jesus is always prepared. Nothing catches him by surprise. Every detail was meticulously scheduled by Jesus, just as your life has been meticulously scheduled. Now, don't get me wrong. There are mysteries about the working of evil that I don't understand. There are scars and wounds in people's lives that you better be very careful about attributing to God's action because God does not tempt any man and he can only give good gifts if you have been deeply traumatized by the evil behavior of another that came from a different direction but God knows about it my mind as a human being my mind has remained sane by knowing that God is governing and watching over and superintending all the details of my life, even when things were at their worst. Jesus is always prepared. Are you? Are you following the great shepherd and being prepared when he calls you? But what's interesting is this picture of Jesus being prepared is a microcosm of God Almighty's great preparation of the world in prophetic scripture. So when Jesus arrived, the Jews should have said, Da, you've been telling us this for thousands of years. But they didn't even recognize him. Even though there is a myriad of Old Testament scriptures that prophesied this and all other details of Christ's life. 
So as Jesus is prepared, God has prepared the world all the way back, beginning in Genesis 49. Do you remember that text? Jacob is blessing his 12 sons, and he comes to Judah, and in chapter 49, he says to Judah, son, you're you're like a lion. You will henceforth be known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's verse 9. Then you go on to verse 10. He says, oh, about this lion of the tribe of Judah, I want you to know. And then he says, the lion of the tribe of Judah will have a colt tied to a young or new vine. So in the Jewish mind, this colt harkens all the way back to Genesis chapter 49. Then you move all the way over to the book of Psalms. And you realize in Psalm 118, the details of Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry was prophesied so the Jews would know when they witnessed this event, the Messiah has come, Christ has arrived. They used the words verbatim from the ancient Hebrew text. In fact, the word Hosanna only appears once in the Hebrew language, and that's in Psalm 119, verse 25, I think it is. And it's save now, Lord, save, Lord, the people began. And then, of course, uh, you sang it just a few minutes ago, that uh, verse from Zechariah. Remember that text Uh, In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. He is humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So just just as Jesus prepared for this moment, the Father prepared the world for Jesus in the bold stand that he would take in the next paragraph. And that's the third thing I want you to see. This is the eruption of the kingdom of God on earth. This, the next text, is his kingdom on earth. It's Jesus asserting his divine and royal right as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Picture that in your paragraph. Excuse me, in your mind. Picture that paragraph in your mind. I'm back in talk words. I mean, I'm talking backwards. You with me? (laughs) I'm not even with me. How can you be with me? I'm kidding. Picture that in your mind. Here comes the colt. People lay some cloaks over it. Jesus sits down on the colt. It took their breath away. They knew full well what it meant. Jesus was born the king. He's simply demonstrating his right now publicly to the nation of Israel. The wise men came and said, when he was arrived from the womb of Mary, where is he that is born king, king of the Jews? They weren't crowning him king here. They were installing him as king, attempting. He was already the king. Jesus never ceased to be the king of all kings. But through many of his miracles, he said, shh, 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 shh. I don't want you to tell anybody. Because the timing isn't right. Do you remember the story in John chapter 6 when he healed the individual and the, the messianic fervor became so great that the text says they were about to force Jesus to become king and he disappeared out of their midst because he's in control of the timing. He chose this moment to say to Israel, I am your long-awaited king. I do reign over you. I do rule over you. But the timing was vital. You have to remember the conversation between Jesus and Pilate when he was interviewed by Pilate. Pilate asked him a very simple question. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, who, who, are you asking this for yourself or for somebody else? And Pilate asked him again, and Jesus said, this is the reason for which I came into the world declaring the truth. He affirmed that he is king, and he affirmed that he was king before Pilate, hence the sign over his cross. Jesus, king of the Jews, because he was and is king of the Jews. I don't want to mess with what you think about the cult, 
But it's very clear from the Old Testament that this wasn't meant necessarily as an act of humility. It's actually meant as an act of royalty. There are various places in the Old Testament where kings alone were able to ride on a colt that had never been used before. Jesus knew that and the Jews knew it. And they were watching before their very eyes that this colt may, he is humble, of course he's humble, but he's coming as a king in this moment. I do think it's significant that a colt was chosen, not a a raging steed. The Roman soldiers who oppressed the world in which they governed would ride giant steeds to crush the enemy. But Jesus was not installing a military campaign. He did not come to cause a revolution. He came to bring peace. A cult would be a sign of peace because he is the prince of peace. And here he comes riding on a cult. That would be the worship gathering of all worship gatherings, wouldn't it? I'd love to have been in that crowd. I would have ripped off my coat, brought as many palm branches as I could to lay out that blanket, that that carpet for Jesus, that royal carpet for Jesus as he marches through the gates of Jerusalem, listening to the shouts of the people, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who's come to bring the kingdom of our father, David. Save us now, Lord. Save now, Lord. Fact of the matter is, Jesus had come to save. But he had not come to save in the way that Jews thought he would. He was their deliverer. He was their savior. He was their conqueror. He was their king. He was their Lord. But we know he would give freedom through the blood of his cross. He would reconcile us to God by the great sacrifice he made, and the Father would see his suffering and accept. You still tracking with me, church family? I'm so far. I could preach for three hours, but some of you are already going to sleep. And I understand that. How do you sit there with a mask and not go to sleep? I don't know how you... I think you're very brave to come out with masks. It's miserable. I suspect it's because you long for the word to be fed to your souls. I suspect it's because you want to worship God. So thank you. Track with me. Because I, I think the last... I'm calling this a four-part harmony. The people were singing to Jesus. The four-part harmony of our salvation is his presence on earth. He brought the kingdom of God and installed us into the kingdom of God by speaking his word to us for, from ancient times. And now, uh, in verse 11... He does what appears to be completely incidental, but it isn't. It's perhaps the most important part of this whole passage. He steals a quiet moment and goes into the temple. That would be Herod's temple. Quite magnificent as it was. You know, of course, that Herod the Great was known as a a massive builder, and he built the Jews... An impressive temple. So Jesus walked into Herod's temple. And he says he looked at everything. Do you see what that says? He's looking around at the various rooms, the various pieces of furniture. He's thinking about what's happened here through the long history of the people of the Jews. He has to be thinking about the creation of the tabernacle in the wilderness under Moses. He has to be thinking about that movable temple. When the people saw the bright shining glory of God descend upon it so that they knew the presence of God was with them. He had to be thinking about that. He had to picture the glory of God as it descended upon the Solomonic temple. And the strength and courage and peace It gave to the Jews when they saw the Shekinah glory descending upon the temple. But he also had to be thinking about the two sad occasions that the Old Testament records of Ichabod. The glory of God departed the camp, the tabernacle, and the temple because the people chose to worship idols rather than to worship the true and living God. 
The Lord warned them. And then Ezekiel chapter 10. You talk about a chapter that will leave your head spinning. I read it, and then I have to examine about 15 commentaries to figure out what it's actually saying. But scholars are saying Ezekiel 10 is the record of the glory of God departing from the temple because of the idolatry of the people of Israel, and they're carried off in Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C., and the glory of God hovers over the Mount of Olives. You listening to me, church family? The glory of God left the temple and waits at the Mount of Olives. And along comes Jesus. And John, after observing him for a long time, called him the Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his what? His glory! You know what this is saying, don't you? Jesus is taking his right as God upon whom the glory dwells. And he is the new temple. Jesus is our new temple. We belong to his body. We belong to him. And if you want to you see the glory, we're all, we're all enticed by the spectacular. We love to imagine this bright, shining, brilliant glory as it descended. And Jesus comes along and in humility and peace, and patience, and kindness, and love. Works among us, lives among us, forgives his enemies, speaks the truth, but loves as no other human being has ever loved. And in seeing him love the way he loves, we see the glory of God. See, the glory of God isn't a stunning majesty that blinds its beholder. It's a moral, spiritual beauty that is replicated in our hearts by the Holy Spirit today. I can taste the glory of God through Jesus Christ as much as the Jews got to see it descend over the tabernacle in the temple. In following in the footsteps of Jesus, I can say, I don't need to worship in Jerusalem. I don't need to worship in Toronto. I don't need to worship in, where are we? Mississauga. I can worship anywhere because this temple is a movable temple. It is an invisible temple. It's a spiritual temple. I'm part of the body of Christ, the family of God, the household of faith. I'm being built up as a spiritual dwelling in which the Spirit of God dwells. I think there are two ways that the child of God can shout Hosanna to the Lord. The first comes on the day of your salvation because Hebrews chapter 7 verse Remember, Hosanna is, save now, Lord, save, help. Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save to the uttermost all who come to God through him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So I can shout, Hosanna. I was lost, now I'm found. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was a rebel, Now I am obedient. My heart has changed. My life has changed. I went from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Glory to God. Hosanna in the highest. But then there's a future day coming in which this same Jesus that we've been talking about who walked into the temple that day is coming back. Zechariah chapter 14 details it. It's the coming day of the Lord. I think it's a day of judgment that will come but it comes just before his glorious appearing. And Zechariah 14 says that the feet of Jesus Christ will touch down on the Mount of Olives and they will split in two. And he'll march through the eastern gate of the city of Jerusalem and he will be here to install the new Jerusalem. Whatever your eschatology, and I'm not so sure about many of these things, all that I know is Jesus said he'd come back And when his feet touch down on planet earth, he'll make all things new. And I'm going to be part of shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Glory to King Jesus. All hail King Jesus. So we thank you 
that you humbled yourself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross or death on a cross. Thank you that you were willing, Lord Jesus, as the great king of all kings, as the king of majesty and glory that you are, that you would submit yourself to that earthly pilgrimage to die in our place as our substitute on the cross so that we could see your glory again, so that we could be reconciled to the Father. Now, Lord, I pray that your people can rejoice and celebrate, not because of earthly circumstance, but because of what you are doing in the world today for your name's sake. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.